Welcome everyone to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, also known as Wolf, and with me is Anthony and Tony. Yeah, I saw you trying to get in there. He's just going up closer. Yeah, yeah right. right. Sure. Whatever. <laughs> so anyways, folks, uh, before we get started, we got a few things to talk about. Of course, we got the uh, Facebook groups. We got uh, Paranormal uh, Roundtable group, and then we have Paranormal Lounge, which is Nelly's group, uh, in Humanoids with Barton Nunley. Uh, what other groups do we got? The uh, the holistic healing. Uh, I believe we have the paranormal prayer group. Prayer group, and then we have the PRT Wolf PRT fan page. Yeah, uh, which was created by Phil Stern along with uh, Europe chapter Paranormal Roundtable. It's got a few thousand people in that too. So yeah, before we get started though, let's talk about um, what we got to talk about. I am Josh Turner 940 on Instagram. If you're interested in Instagram, if anybody likes to go to Instagram, Tony, what is yours? I'm um, PRT Mushu. You can find me on Instagram at that, or uh, you can find me on Facebook as well. Yeah. And Anthony, what is yours? My Instagram, I believe, is Mexican Jumping Meme. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, that being said, look us up on Instagram. We can become friends. We're still not 100% on um, the facebook uh approving a, re- a friend request because we had a bunch of stuff going on so we're trying to make sure that we're good to go to start approving those friend requests but um you know i i honestly i have about 300 sitting in the queue so i gotta figure that out um but don't be offended if i don't accept your friend request right away because there's been a lot happening that being said let's get started um oh wait we got the patreon do you want to explain it, Anthony? Yeah, so our Patreon is uh, patreon.com slash PRT podcast. We have five tiers ranging from $10 a month to $50 a month, uh, regardless of what tier you sign up for. After two months of being on that tier, you're going to get a swag bag with the uh, autographed books, with the with a shirt, uh, some merchandise with all kinds of goodies. Whether you're on the $10 tier or $50 tier, you're going to get a lot more than your money's worth out of it. We want to show our appreciation for your support, and the Patreon is a very good way to support uh, what we're doing here. Yeah, and so be sure and join the Patreon. It's a good way to support the show. Um, that being said, another good way to support the show is to go and tune in on the live streams or YouTube exclusives Friday and Sunday. We do live streams that go two and a half to three hours. Friday, we have a guest every Friday and Sunday. We do not typically, and we retell people's encounters. So here we go. Uh, That's what we're doing here today, which is Tuesday. Thursday, we always have a guest too, which is just the hour long uh, version of the Friday show. And so here we go. Uh, The first thing I want to talk about, because we were talking about this on the live stream, we were talking about encounters that happened in Central Texas, and it was predominantly around Lake Buchanan, uh, Inks Lake, uh, places uh, in, in, you know that, that are around those areas. Inks Lake is like Kingsland, Burnett, all that. Lake Buchanan uh, is, is 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 in that area. You know, Marble Falls. It's all those places right there that they encompass that region that we were talking about of ghosts and and different types of things, Dogman and Bigfoot. This story, though, I thought was interesting. It is a goat man story. My wife had asked me when we were out there driving around on Sunday uh, around Kingsland, and we went to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house because there's a restaurant there now called Hooper's. We went in there. Uh, we did not eat. We were already we had already eaten. I bet you they have really good head cheese there. <laughs> <laughs> Tove Hooper was the uh, director, and I'm going to give a quick plug to my friend and colleague, Chris Garitano, who wrote the book, South Texas Blues, based on the making of the film, and uh, go and check out his book. And he's a big uh, uh, horror movie guy, and of course, he's known for the Montauk Chronicles, Strange Land, and his new project, A Haunting We Will Go, and his podcast, Off to the Witch. So, that being said... I have history with that house. I played there when I was a kid, and my dad's friend used to used to have it. And then our friend, Eric Palazzos from Media Palace, his aunt owned it at one time, and they had a really weird experience where they all woke up outside in the yard. Uh, not long after that, we had somebody give us an alien, or what may have been a UFO alien abduction, I don't know. Weird story out of that area, because it used to be where the La Frontera Shopping Center is in Round Rock. 
they moved the whole house to Kingsland, where it's now a restaurant. Uh, really neat place. So we were out there, and she asked me about Goatman stories. So I went back, and I knew that around Marble Falls in that area, there were some Goatman stories. I found some off of 281. If you go to Highway 281, they're right there on that highway, about five miles out of Marble Falls going toward Austin. I had someone who gave me a pretty creepy goat man story. And this person claimed that they were driving down the highway and they pulled off the road because they had to check something in the back of their truck because something had flown out like some feed bags. And so they were like, they got out and they noticed that their son had thrown a bunch of feed bags in there and hadn't secured them. And a couple of them were, were empty uh, completely empty, and they blew out. So he's like, oh, no, I better stop and check and see what all's back there because his son had used his vehicle to feed some cows, and that is what happened next. This is how it happened. He pulls over. Guy's name is Ken. He's out there uh, in the middle of nowhere. He goes out there, and he's checking, and then he notices that – When he was in the back messing with whatever, he sees something to his right move very quickly, which looked like a white flash. He looks over into this pasture on the other side of this barbed wire fence, and he sees standing there holding the barbed wire fence, looking at him. Now, this is is very interesting. Was an eight-foot-tall, white, goat-man-like creature. He shined the flashlight that he was holding in into its eyes, and the, it didn't blink or do anything, and the eyes were like pink looking. Oh, it was like an albino? Yeah, kind of like an albino. Yeah, and he said that it was standing there, and next to it was a coyote. He's like, and it was definitely a coyote. And I said, it wasn't a dog or anything. He says, no, it was a coyote standing there next to it. He goes, and I look down, I see the legs, and but he's wearing what looks like a... Like a uh, like a shirt, kind of like a shirt, like a tunic, I guess you would say. But he said it was like a shirt with a belt wrapped around it and it covered his privates. So it was wearing clothing and it had something slung over its shoulder, which he said resembled a bow, like a bow and arrow. Like, you know, you would see. And he said there was a bow and what looked like a quiver with arrows in it. And he's like, and I'm looking at this thing and it's looking right at me. And he goes, and when I, I sat there staring at this thing, he goes, it happened, it was like, For several minutes, we sat there. 2002, it happened in 2002. And he said, I was sitting there staring at this thing. And he said that it began to speak to me. And he's like, and I could not, for the life of me, understand a word of what it was saying to me. He's like, but it had a goat-like head. It was not like a satyr. Like, you know, he didn't know anything about satyrs. This is an old cowboy. But he said that it was much, very much like a goat head on a man's body with humongous shoulders. Not overly muscular, but really tall. And he said that it was kind of lanky and lean. It didn't have any like fat on it, but it, the lower legs were very much like goat-like. It was the, the upper body was a man. The arms were like a man. Um, and it was holding the barbed wire fence, just kind of had its hand on it and was looking at him. And it tried speaking to him with its mouth. It was no tele- telepathy at all. And he said that it looked like a very primitive being. And I asked him, guys, what do you mean primitive being? <laughs> Now, here's the interesting thing about Ken. Back in 1977, he saw a Bigfoot. He saw a Bigfoot when he's living near Qu- in Cuero, Texas. He was married to a woman at that time who her family owned land out in Cuero. And when he was married to her, uh, she pa- subsequently she passed away. Um, but he said that when she he was married to her, her father had died and they inherited like 140 acres of land. And he was living on the other side of Cuero, and that the father did not, um, he like did not have a problem with him at all. It was like he was a son to him, you know. So he had no problem. Like it's like, oh, as soon as he passed, um, now he did have a problem with his actual son because the son had a drug problem. So they had issues, and the son uh, of his, you know, his father in law, basically his, his wife's brother would come to their property and cause problems. And his son, his him and his late wife's oldest son, they had two, he had a bone to pick 
with this guy because this uncle of his, this bad seed, attacked him at a local beer joint, tuned him up, and ended up uh, creating a, a big problem. And he was told, if you come on my property, I'm going to deal with you. One night, he goes to their property, drunk as a skunk, does a bunch of donuts in the front yard, does all kinds of crazy stuff, opens the fence, lets all his cows out, and just just, just basically be, being a nuisance, and then shot up their windows of their house while they were gone. When he returned, the, the guy's truck was turned over on its side, and he was laying underneath a tree with two broken legs, and he was very, very, very injured. But what happened to this guy was not like what you would think it was not like it didn't happen from him neck being negligent with the vehicle the story that he told and this is really really interesting was that a nine foot tall hairy creature came out of the wood line this is in their court this is uh on the other side of Quero, texas years ago back in the 70s grabbed the side of his truck and shoved it over and it rolled three times by this massive, hairy, ape-like creature that was screaming and yelling at him. His son tells him, he goes, now this is what my son told me. He says, my son told me, he says, dad, I think that that's the creature that saved me. He had a motorbike and he flipped it and he broke his neck. But it was a vertebrate in his neck. It didn't snap. He was, by the grace of God, he didn't break his spine. This was his middle son. Um, him and his oldest son, they were out riding, riding motor, m- dirt bikes. And he says, and I had to, he had to go, tried to pick his brother up. He couldn't. There's nothing he could do. And he's like, I can't move. I'm paralyzed. The older son was, was cognizant enough at the age of 17 to run back to the house, which was like about two miles up the road um, on his bike and tell him, hey, there's been an accident. When he rode back, he said, now this is weird. He said that there was a rattlesnake that slithered right up to him. Like he was almost laying on top of it. He said, and then he just sees this the snake slither up to him, lift up its head like it's going to strike, and then boom, he sees this hand, this hairy hand, reach down, grab the snake, and just whip it around, and he hears a pop. And he looks up, and he sees this massive ape-like creature that has a human like face. He said it was like it was mixed between a human and an ape. And he's like, it looked right at him and it just tossed the snake over his shoulder and it gently picked him up. And you know, I'm I'm shocked as you are. Mm-hmm. Gently picks him up and begins to walk him back toward the house. Then when the the the, the son, his other son gets to the house, there's nobody there. It was back in the 70s. They had no way to call people, do you know, whatever. Um on a cell phone. So he had to use the phone. He called an ambulance. And then he looks out the window, his oldest son, and he sees uh, this big mountain of fur, as he called it, just laying his brother down on the ground. He walks out there and he onto the porch, and this thing turns and walks back into the brush and is gone. And his brother, who's going in and out of consciousness and has three broken vertebrae in his neck and his upper back and a broken arm, um, he says, dude, he says, I don't know if I was dreaming or not, but I think Chewbacca just picked me up. And so his his other son made a full recovery miraculously. They took him to the to the hospital down in Houston. He had a bunch of surgeries and he never he, he has pain to this day in his body, but he never like it never detrimented. Yeah, it didn't th- there was no spinal injury or anything like that. He was paralyzed when this thing picked him up, but when it took him back and laid him down and he woke up, he was able to move his arms. Like, he felt like there was this enormous amount of heat coming from these things' hands. Now, I had Chris Kramer on the show who said that his hand, you remember that? Mm -hmm. His hand got mangled. That was on the live stream. Yeah, Yeah. that was on the live stream almost last Friday. And then he came back and went in the the tent, and that's when he started feeling the... Mm -hmm. He felt like the tent unit was on his back. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. that was a really interesting conversation because you guys talked about how, like, like this, like it's so hard to figure out what's the difference between what what makes one do a good act and what makes one do a bad act. It's so iffy, iffy that it's so hard to tell. Well, it could be the people, and that's yeah. what that's what we're yeah. getting at here. And, and let me tell you the story. So going back to this encounter he had in 2002 with this goat man like creature, this guy Ken said he goes, I look up and I see this creature, and it's it's you know he goes, it's dark. 
He's like, but the full the moon is full. He goes, and by the full moon, I can see this creature, and it's there's a coyote, and the coyote is sitting there like a dog on on its back, you know, legs, just sitting up like a dog, looking at me, not barking, not growling, and very docile. And he goes, it was a very large coyote too, and it was right there to the right of this creature. He goes to my left, to its right. He goes, and I'm stunned. I'm sitting here looking at what looks like a goat headed being. And the thing just talked to him in these weird, in this weird language. He said years later, his daughter, when he began to try to give some of the words to her, she said, because she's really, really good with language because her husband teaches uh, Latin, but he's also fluent in three other languages like Greek, you know, these old languages. Um, I can't remember what the other ones were. But he said that, that her, her, his daughter said that she thinks that it was Greek, that it was speaking. And so he said, it's all Greek to me, like <laughs> <laughs> joking, jokingly, you know, and he's a good old boy. He's a good cowboy guy, you know, and, but it's just, uh, he's like, dude, it was so hard to come to terms. With. And th- this is actually one of his daughter's friends that got him to, to contact me because she listens to the show. Um, but it was really interesting, though, that that he is ha- now in that family. They've had two encounters with what may or may not be in humanoids slash cryptids, but they were both benign. Nothing bad came of any of this. He goes, he says, okay, goodbye. And he waves at it. And he gets in his truck and he drives off. Now, I asked him this question. I said, Ken, you've had an encounter with what is a goat man. And while you were at work years ago. Your your wife and you were gone um, at work. You know your 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 land you had out there out in the middle of nowhere. Really, I was like, you know, you you had something that happened. You know, to your son, he believes that he was healed by a Bigfoot. I said, now that's interesting. I had looked that up, um, and it was interesting that that this guy had had an encounter in Marble Falls. One thing led to another, and of course, you know, we have these stories that, that people say happen where they're getting attacked and practically killed by these creatures. And then you have every now and then, like Chris Kramer's story and this guy's story, which coincidentally ties into the to the Marble Falls thing, too. Uh, we get a lot of stories out of Marble Falls area. But by the same token, we have the story, you know, where the guy was riding with his son, and out there outside of Lago, in between Lago Vista and Marble Falls on 1431, right there in the creek, um, this Bigfoot took a rock and just threw it at this guy's window. And he's like, dude, that, that by the grace of God, it didn't go through the windshield and kill my son. Or just, you he know. He threw a Nolan Ryan fastball at his son. Or deer carcasses. Or, or do whatever. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the goat man does it too. Mm-hmm. In particular, like Purgatory Road, they throw like stag heads in the middle of the road, you know. To me, it's shocking. You know, it's like somebody gives you a story of of like them doing something that you wouldn't expect, which is to heal. So I don't know. I mean, uh, your it definitely thoughts? just makes you think. I mean, it's one of those things where, and this is the problem with you know the paranormal in general is that it's so hard to gain evidence to be able to make come to conclusions that will determine one way or another and. Every story you give, you know, you, the unfortunate part is, is that it is a story that we are receiving. We, we don't have any way to verify or determine in a way that could lead us into a basis of like, oh, because of X, Y, and Z, they act like this. Because of X, Y, and Z, they act like this. We can't do that in any way. So we're just kind of left baffled at these actions in which they either come off as nightmares or they come off as like you know your savior. It, it's 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 really hard to deal with because you have no way to really determine it, and that that's why though it's so important for us. Very important at least why we tell you that they are dangerous. Why we tell you like we warn you because sure, yeah. you, there's no way to you're know. You're not gonna know. Yeah. And would you jump off a parachute if it, or would you jump off a plane with a parachute if you only knew it had a fifty percent chance of working? No. Yeah. I mean, so it's the same thing here. Why would you do something so dangerous with like half the knowledge and then not truly understanding what you're talking about? This is something that people don't understand anyway. Your thought? Well, I think the fact that the overwhelming majority of the time these goat men are seen as black with red eyes, but yet this one it still had red eyes, but it was well, white. Pink. They were pink. Huh? 
Okay, well, they were pink. They weren't red, they were pink, but similar. I think most of the black ones we hear about are typically off of that Purgatory Road area. But I mean, like every time that, that like someone encounters like a, a black goat man, it's like mean, aggressive, just like an evil mm-hmm. uh, creature. But maybe this one being white had, had something to do with its with its nature. I mean, because mm, I've, I've... We've heard some white ones too. No, white the ones are pretty thing. terrifying They too. do the same thing. I mean, I've just never heard of a white goat man encounter where like they actually helped someone. I don't know. It's just, it's just way out of the all. It out didn't of the help norm. him though. No. I mean, it didn't help him. I mean, it just didn't hurt him. Tried to communicate with him even. I think he's what? thinking of the Bigfoot. The Bigfoot oh, that carried okay, the yeah. bat. The, yeah. I think yeah, that was a Bigfoot, not a goat man. Yeah, okay. The Bigfoot though did. Yeah, it did help, help him. You know, yeah. And we've got a few. I mean, there's a few stories. Bigfoot's out there. definitely one of the ones where you would expect it more for them. I to mean, be but helpful. we've heard about it with Dogman too, though. I mean, look at Lisa's yeah, story. That's she, true. She, it didn't hurt her. You know. One of those weird things, man, is it's where you can't really determine between these things, especially if you're dealing with, you know, aliens or, I mean, not alien, I mean, the government made our government experimented on ones and you have some that may be from the inner earth or some from, you know, an alternate dimension, how they act and how they are naturally can vary so much that it's impossible to give you pure good advice about how to interact with these beings Mm -hmm. i mean and anyone who does i wouldn't trust because that's not something that you can verify throughout you know across the board yeah because it doesn't does it apply overwhelmingly though most of what we get is pretty horrifying pretty violent or it's just kind of like benign i guess they're not really they're not really helping you they're not we don't know what would happen a lot of them we just they're just quick encounters but uh, yeah, I guess that's that's it for that story. Um, his son, like I said, made a full recovery and lived his life. But Thankfully. according to him, he had a Bigfoot encounter. You know, it's crazy too because it's like here in Texas, people have weird stuff happen to them, and they're not interested in like <laughs> making it public at all. Like they're not like out there trying to get people to hear their story and make it into a big famous encounter. It's just like it's just there, you know. Yeah. It just happens and. He's like Texas more than any other state. It'll, it'll happen like random conversation that he'll tell you some horrific that, you know, life changing. Yeah. Like, oh, I went to the store Tuesday. Oh, Tuesday I got killed. I almost got killed by Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. So here, here's a ghost story here. Uh, and this happened in, in uh, well, it was funny because my wife had asked me about something, some kind of massacre that had happened in Victoria. And I said, yeah, there was one that happened years ago, an Indian uh, massacre where they had gone into Victoria and burned it down and killed a bunch of uh, settlers, the Comanches. And um, so I went in and I looked and I was like, I wonder if I have stories from Victoria. And yeah, sure enough, I did. This one was a ghost story. It was pretty, uh, it was pretty creepy. Um, but this lady was living in an old house in Victoria, Texas, and it was summertime, and her grandchildren were there visiting. And she's like, she'd only been living. It, it wasn't an old. It wasn't an old house. I, I got that part wrong. It's not a big old house. A big house, but it wasn't that old. It was only about four years old when when she moved into it in 1991. And she said it was uh, a nice brick house. You know, it was four bedroom. It was beautiful. Uh, her husband had pretty pretty messed up right after they got the house. He cheated on her. And she caught him with her best friend. So that was the worst thing that ever happened to her there. But she decided that she was going to sell it. But then she decided, you know what? I'm going to keep it. I'm just gonna, I'm not going to let this. Mar- she, it was her dream house. And so she was like, I'm going to keep the house. And so her two grandchildren were, were over. And they were playing, you know, video games or whatever. And she said that they were in there playing Nintendo or whatever. And uh, she was like, I hear like a voice coming from the bedroom where they were playing. And she's like, and I'm walking by with a laundry basket and I look and she says, I see three kids. And I'm like, I did a double take and I looked again and I was like, what the heck? So she goes and she stands behind the three children playing. One one is her grandson. The other one is her granddaughter. And she's like, but there's a third kid, this dark haired, uh, darker skinned kid. It looks like he's Hispanic. And she's like, and my kids are, are, you know, my grandchildren, they're very light skinned. Um, and she's like, and I don't, this is not my, you know, and so I'm, I'm like, who's your little friend? And they're like, what? And they turn and they look at me and I'm looking down 
She's like, and I'm like, who's your little friend? And they were like, what, grandma? And so they both kind of looked and then they just kept turning back to playing. And she notices that this child that's in front of her, she can't see his face. Get this. He's got the Nintendo controller, but the cord is just going to nowhere. And then she was like, uh, okay. And she's like, she's never had any kind of ghosts or anything in this house ever. Nothing, not a nothing, never heard anything. Although she did say she had a cat named Munchkin. And if the cat did get freaked out sometimes and would jump and run, um, and she had a wiener dog that would act up or whatever, sometimes would act out, but she didn't have nothing that ever, she just thought they were just kind of jumpy animals. She never thought anything of it, you know? And she said, and my, my dog and my cat were only a few months apart, and they'd been together for years, and him and her were like two peas in a pod. They never, you know, they played and whatever. So she said that she was like, this child, like, who is this child, you know? And she's like, and it was weird because I looked down, and my little weenie dog, he looks up at me, and he just starts kind of gently wagging his tail. And she's like, he liked to bark, and especially at strangers. And he acted like he couldn't even see this child that was sitting there. And she's like, excuse me, excuse me. And she's like, uh, y'all need to stop for a minute. And they're like, what, Grandma? And she, then she's like, look, don't take a tone with me. She's like, I need to know who this young man is. Is this your little friend? What is he doing here? Did you invite him? And she's like, they they look and they, they, they stopped. They looked real puzzled. And they're like, what do you mean? And she's like, this young man who's sitting right in front of you. Then she walks around the other side, and when she looks at this child, she sees this child has no eyes, and where his mouth should be, she said it looked like a, a, a small shark's mouth. She's like, I kid you not. He looked like he was like he had hollowed out eyes, and his teeth looked like, like, like something out of jaws. And she's like, am I hallucinating? What am I seeing here? What is going on? And she says that he stands up and then he begins to like kind of close his mouth. She's like, and this weird shriek comes out and both of the children jump and are scared and they run out of the room. And she's like, and I'm standing there, and the dog too, they all ran out. And she's like, and he's standing between me and the door. She's like, so I try to go to his left or to my left and to his right and get away from him. She's like, and he goes and stands between me and the door. And I look at this thing that's standing there and it is not a child at all. She's like, I don't know what it is. She's like, so I literally went to the window, lifted the window up and just pushed the screen out and crawled out the window. And she's like, and I yelled to the children. I was like, go outside, meet me outside. She's like, she goes out, she goes to the neighbor. She gets the kids and the dog and the cat are all out there with her. She picks up the cat and the dog and walks to the neighbors and calls the police. The police come. They search every inch of the house. Nothing's there. Nothing at all. About six months later, she says, nothing else happened. She's like, I didn't sleep there for like two nights. We went and stayed at, a, at, our, at my sister's house in Port Lavaca. And she said that about, about six months later, she was out. Her laundry, her washing machine had gone out. So she goes to the neighbors and says, hey, you know, her neighbor's name is Linda. She's a real nice lady. She goes, I go to the neighbor and Linda and me are washing our clothes. And she says, you know, uh, she goes, she knew the story. She goes, you know, I did some looking around, you know, and there was a, ch a child that had died uh, in a car accident, you know. She's like, but he was about 14. She goes, well, this kid looked like he was probably seven or eight, at least the size of this being, you know. And she's like, and I don't think that has anything to do with this thing you know showing up in our house yeah, yeah. showing up in her house and she goes yeah that's really odd she goes you know there were some people that 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 lived in this house prior to me living here and she goes and i see the lady every now and then there's a restaurant they like to go eat at and she's like and i've seen her in there and her and her husband have talked to me about if i had seen the ghost she's like but i've heard things i've felt things but i never saw anything She's like, so next time I talk to him, maybe I'll get a little more information about it. So sure enough, she does. And they go to Sunday, you know, lunch after church. Um, they all went to church together. And that particular uh, uh, day, she goes, I wasn't feeling too good. I, I had missed church at my church that I went to. And so she goes, my neighbor comes over. She brings me some soup. And we started talking. And she says, I want to tell you something. She goes, they gave me a little more information about this supposed ghost that lived in my house. 
They said that sometimes they would see it in the window over here at your house, looking at them. And they described it as a child with deep sunken in eyes and that it would sometimes, uh, they would see it walking back and forth from that of your house to their house. And that every now and then they would get a, they would get a good look at it. Somebody would come over or like a babysitter that was babysitting their grandkids or I mean their children would see it. And they described it as a demonic looking elf, like childlike being. And she's like, and that's all they, they said. They just said that that's what they ne- didn't say anything about it having rows of sharp teeth or anything like that. She goes, well, what I saw definitely did. She's like, but it did look different at different times. Sometimes it had really pronounced pointy ears or made them think it was like an elf. And then other times it looked like a normal human, but like a very small diminutive human, approximately three foot tall. So she said that she never saw it again. But on the day that she was moving out, and she said it was 1998, she was moving out, and she had her uh, former brother-in-law come over. He's a really nice guy, him and his wife. They were still friends. And they came over, and they were moving, and he came running out of the, the garage, garage door, out into the garage, and he said, I just saw like a some sort of small demon or something sitting under the bed in the guest bedroom. And she, she goes, what? And she goes, she walks in there. His, her sister-in-law was like, what? All freaked out. She goes, I immediately knew what it was. And she's like, yes, years ago, she's like, when I had the grandkids over, we had, she told him about that incident. So he was terrified after that. So he called a couple of his friends to come and help him. And he wouldn't be alone in the house until they moved everything out. He was just scared to death. But she said it never ma- materialized again in her house and other than that time when they were moving. So I thought that, that, that was kind of interesting. But hauntings are really weird. You know, they're really weird things, you know. So you said that, that neither of the kids nor the animals actually saw this thing? They weren't reacting to they it. Were not until the very end when he... Not until the end when he shrieked. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean... that they, Or screamed. They, they heard it, but did they, they actually didn't see, see it? it? They never saw. It's well, usually the other well, way. She around. asked the wiener dog, and the wiener dog had no comment. So, obviously, and the cat either. Well, I mean, <laughs> the, they they might not have spoken English. Maybe they were like uh, the the wiener dogs probably spoke German. Wow, are you looking down on their education? No, the the wiener dog. Are you judging them? The dachshund is German. That's what he speaks. She should have asked him in German. So you're oh, being so he's bigoted, too stupid to learn English. Now? Being bigoted toward the wiener dog. No, she just never taught him English. This is common knowledge. You have to teach the dogs English. No, I don't. Banjo just knows it. <laughs> I guess your dogs are stupid. <laughs> Banjo is pretty much, uh, he just universally knows. Look, I don't, I don't know about the animals, but we can say for sure that the children did not. She said years later, too, when she was telling me this story, she said years later, she's like, the kids never mentioned it. Like they would talk about it, about the shriek, but they never saw this being ever. That's creepy, too, considering how they were just all playing Nintendo. Also, yeah. Also, the, the neighbor, Linda, like never, she never saw it either. She should have mentioned something. I mean, she never, but she never saw it. I yeah, mean, so but like was, if people are telling you like, hey, have you seen the ghost? That I've well, why seen, would that come up ever until somebody tells you that you saw it? If the people that lived in my house told me like, hey, there's a ghost in the neighbor house that sometimes just stares at you. I would be like, I would probably go talk to them, see if they see any ghosts. At the very least, I, that doesn't seem like that crazy of a conversation. Well, you think about it, though. You know, the woman that gave us this story, Judy, she never saw this creature and, or thing until then. Yeah. She'd been there for two years before this happened, right? So, that, I think she moved in in 1991 or something like that. And it was 1993 when this happened. And then her neighbor, they never had any reason because neither one of them had ever seen it. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't until she said, oh, you had this weird incident happen. You know, let me talk to the people that used to live here because they claimed there was a ghost in our house. But she didn't know that they had said until they said, yeah, it used to stare at them from the neighbors too. Oh, yeah, that's true. So, I mean, why would they even, it would never come up. I mean, it's a weird thing too because she said after that, there wasn't a whole lot. Oh, no, there was another incident. One time she said that when she put a bowl, I think it was like a bowl of chili or something in a microwave. And she said that the microwave door popped open and the chili thing flew out. And that was at one of her other grandkids, not the two that were there that time, but a different one. And she said that she had several grandkids, but she said that one was like, like, Meemaw, Meemaw, she called her. 
said that the, her bowl of chili had flown out of the, the microwave. But other than that, she said there wasn't really a lot that ever happened. I don't know. Like I said, hauntings are weird, dude. Yeah. Like, I mean, you can't you can't predict when it's going to happen. Yeah, you don't, it's all you know. dependent on the ghost, too, because yeah. it could be seasonal. Yeah, and just when you think that there's like common ground and that you can use to try and explain things like stuff, there's stories like this that, that just kind of defy all of that. Yeah. But now we're going to leave the friendly confines of Texas and we're going to go up to north, uh, upstate New York, up in the far north. Uh, th- these these are two guys that gave me a story. Well, one of them in particular gave me a story, and he said that him and his friends, there were two or three of them, and they were coming back from a Buffalo Bills game. Um, I can only imagine how how bad that sucked. But anyway, they're, I'm kidding, folks. I don't care. So anyway, they they were coming back from this Buffalo game, and they are driving along, and they see this black mass in the road. And it looked like a shadow person, like this guy. He said, dude, it looked like how you would think of, like you would see a shadow being. He said, when when I was a kid, me and my brothers, my two brothers, we shared a room because there were six kids and they lived in Rochester, New York. And he said that we saw this shadow being come out but from the, the, the girls' room as they were screaming and it just came right through the wall and materialized. He goes, and we saw it. He goes, and it looked like a, a cowboy. He goes, dude, it had a cowboy hat on and everything. It was like unbelievable. He goes, and I was the youngest of the three boys. Um, it's weird how they were born. He said there were three boys born. I was the middle child, absolutely middle child. And then the oldest of the girls was born and then two more girls. So there were three boys and then three girls. Uh, and he goes, and I was the youngest boy. He goes, and I was seven years old at the time. My brother Randy and Nick, they were eight and nine. He said there was nine, eight, and seven, literally three years apart. And then the youngest, uh, the oldest uh, of the girls was born two years after me. He said, and so he's like, at this point in time, he goes, uh, the, the two little girl, the uh, younger girls, one of them was still a baby and was living and was sleeping in the parents' room. But he goes, my sister that was five and the other sister, I guess her name was Mandy or something like that. I can't remember her name, but anyway, she was like four. So there was like a five-year-old and a four-year-old, and they started screaming. So his oldest brother, you know, Randy, was like, oh, did he go? Immediately, he runs to go see what's going on. Then he comes running back into the room and says, dude. And at that point, it was already like coming through the wall. He's like, and it was a shadow being, an absolutely sh- a shadow being, as clear as anything. He's like, and it looked like a, like the outline of a man but like three-dimensional, but also kind of two-dimensional. It was weird. It was hard to explain. And he said, and it came through the wall, and then it just stood there, and then it kind of vibrated, and then just kind of like, kind of bent in a weird shape, (coughs) kind of boomerang-like shape going to to its left, and then just was gone. He's like, it just blinked out of existence. So he said, I've seen these before. I'd seen this before. And he goes, and then I saw one at my grandfather's farm, uh, year, years and years ago, he goes, I had seen one, you know, when I was about 16, he goes, but when I was, he goes, I was 36 years old. I was coming back from Buffalo Bills game and we see this thing in the middle of the road and the headlights illuminate in it. But he goes, the light was just kind of disappearing into this darkness. There was just this figure standing in the middle of the road. He goes, and my, my friend, he goes, he was driving and he's like, I'm in the front seat. My other friend's in the back seat and they're in a Jeep. And he said that my friend was like, whoa, what is that? He goes, and it wasn't like, uh, it was like early October. It wasn't a, uh, you know, when the really cold weather hits, you know, it was like, it was just kind of light, you know, breezy, uh, first game of October, whatever. And he said that it was, it was not super cold yet. And he's like, and we had the windows down, he goes, and we were, we were talking. He's like, and this thing sort of moves one way, then, then at the last minute kind of moved back to be in front of their vehicle. And he was like, I I was sitting there going like, what is that? He goes, then I focused and I realized that it was, you know, like a shadow being. And he goes, dude, look at that. And then he goes, as his friend starts to step on the brakes, he goes, there was no way that he was going to be able to dodge this thing because there was another car coming from the other direction. He goes, and they had to have seen it too. He's like, and we, we passed each other. He's like on the highway and he goes, and there was another vehicle, like, just to our right, like, kind of, like, in our blind spot. He goes, so there was no way for us to just swerve away from it. He's like, and this thing went through the windshield. Like, it went up over the hood like a man would jump. 
And for a minute there, he goes, for a split second, I thought, this is an actual person just dressed in all black. And then he goes, then it came through the windshield. He goes, and it went into the vehicle. And he goes, and as we're driving, it doesn't like dematerialize into any kind of like a smoke or anything like that. He's like, it's just in the vehicle with us. And then it goes into the back seat. He goes, we feel the physical sensation of it going through my left arm and my friend's right arm and right shoulder, my left shoulder. And he goes, and then going through my friend in the back seat. He's like, and then it just goes through and it's gone. And then he goes, we look in the rearview mirrors. We don't see anything. He goes, it was one of the weirdest things that ever happened. Like a literal shadow being physically came into their vehicle, went through the windshield and came and just was gone out the back. Now, I I mentioned his brothers, Nick and Randy. His brother, Nick, had a shadow being encounter with the cowboy guys, they called him, because he never saw it again. But his two older brothers did. And he was at Little League practice. Uh, a few years later, he was like a little older. He was like a few years went by and he goes, and I come home and my brother, uh, Randy had, or his brother, Nick actually had had like a choke marks on his neck and the, his dad had the belt out and was yelling at Randy to tell the truth, tell the truth. And Randy's like, I didn't choke him. And then the mother is like trying to get the, the, the dad under control and then one of the daughters, the, the, the oldest da- of the daughters, his younger sister, who's two years younger than him, she at this time was about nine, I think he said, or something like that, or she was eight, eight or nine. He said that she came into the room and started like yelling at the dad saying, he's telling the truth, he's telling the truth, because the boys, according to the dad, had concocted a story um, that the shadow cowboy guy had actually choked Nick while he was taking a nap. And he was convinced that it was Randy that did it. Didn't believe in their nonsense. But the uh, the oldest uh, daughter came in and said, no, I, was, I saw it. I watched it with my own eyes and began crying and fell to her knees and said, he comes into our room all the time and he grabs things and, and pulls the covers off of us. And, and the dad was like, well, wait a minute, what? And then the mother starts speaking up and says, he's like, I just remember this conversation. He goes, I wasn't you know, privy to all this, you know, because he's like, it wouldn't happen when I was awake. It would happen when I was asleep. My brothers would see it or my sisters would see it. He goes, but I didn't see it. But he said one time the house was haunted. And he said one time when he was in the bathroom um, and he was combing his hair and everybody was fighting to get into the bathroom, you know, um, three bedroom house with six kids. And he said that, you know, he hears this banging on the door And then he sees the doorknob turning back and forth. And he goes, we lived in this old house and it had those old doorknobs, you know, those metal doorknobs, you know, or metal. Yeah. And he goes, I look down and I see the doorknob shaking back and forth violently. He goes, and then I was like, what? Just come in. He goes, and then the door pops open and it just kind of slowly starts to open and he looks and there's nobody there. And the only ones in the house at that time was him, his babysitter, or the babysitter that was there for for the the, the kids. He's like, and it, I remember this. He goes, it was like the day before Halloween, and we had a babysitter, and the older kids, were, my, my older brothers were out doing whatever, and he goes, and I was still young enough. I had to have a babysitter. I was like 12. He said, and I remember sitting there with my younger sisters, and they were all like running around playing. We were the only ones in the house, and they were in the backyard jumping on a trampoline. And he said, and it was just me and the babysitter, the, not the babysitter, the uh, older, oldest uh, sister, two younger ones with babysitter in the backyard. And she comes down the hallway and goes, what? He goes, then she turns and looks, you know, he goes down the hallway to her right. He's like, and I'll never forget. He goes, she's standing there in horror and she runs into her room and goes under the bed. He goes, and then I look down the hallway and I don't see anything. And so I'm like, what is that all about? Why, why is, you know, why is she running in terror? You know? Who is that? The baby sister? His his younger sister. Okay. The oldest girl of the girls. Yeah. And he goes and he goes into her bedroom and she's like shaking like a leaf and he finally gets her to come out and she's like, I saw it again. It's the it's the shadow. And he's like, So we had experiences with the shadow, but he goes, I only physically saw it one time. But uh anyway, that's his story. That's that's what happened to them. You think it was purposely hiding away from him? Because he was so The other kids all saw it more than him. 
That's probably why he's more willing to talk about it. I think it's because like he was always that, you know, being the older brother. Or well, he was the youngest of the boys. <clears throat> being the older brother to them. Well, yeah, I guess not. I mean, he was a witness to a lot of weird I thought of like, behavior he, from his siblings. I thought maybe if like he was the oldest and like he was real big on pro- being protective to his siblings, maybe that would be why he would hi- it would hide away from him. But you know, this doesn't make sense. Why would it shy away from this guy? I don't know, dude. Like I said, hauntings are weird. But yeah, you know, it was just it was a weird thing too that when he got older, this shadow being went through. And I did have to ask. I said, "Was it wearing a cowboy?" And he said, "No." <laughs> Did they ever say what it felt like specifically whenever that thing went through them? Yeah, they did. And, and it, th- th- it was weird because it wasn't cold. It was like warm. It was uh, like some sort of warm like air, you know? Um, and, and they described it kind of as like a, a pillow. Really weird. Like what you would think a cloud would feel like maybe? I don't, I don't know what would a cloud would feel like. I, don't I, mean, know. I would imagine like. Oh, I mean, if a cloud kind of passes through like you. A, spongy nerf material or something like that's that. happened yeah we've heard of that too that's why you're yeah. thinking that because we've heard stories like that i personally i mean i've seen shadow beings several times in my life they're creepy as hell dude i, I don't know what to tell you speaking of that shadow being there i mean i guess there's another one i could tell let me get a little bit of time there and then i got to get on this other one but this one was pretty interesting and i think i told this one the other day um, because Phil had claimed that he had something really weird happen, like this white creature went by his window really quickly, and then his phone died, and he couldn't get it to work anymore. Broke it. So, so that that happened. But what's interesting is that I had a story like that, and I actually got them confused. There were two stories that I thought were one and the same, but they actually weren't. When I went back and looked, there were two different stories. Very similar. One of them was that there was a guy working at a construction site in Toronto back in 2013. And what he told me was, was interesting. He said that he was walking down the hallway where they were building this apartment complex. And he was hired by a security company to work there overnight and guard the construction site. He said, and I'm walking down the hallway and I look and I see this thing standing He goes, probably about 30 yards from me. And he goes, and I see it down at the end of the hallway. There's nobody there but me. Nobody's living there or anything. He's like, and there's this black creature. You know, he goes, what at the time I thought it was a person standing there at the end of the hallway. Well, as he got further down the hall, when he gets gets to about 15 yards away, he stops and he realizes it's not moving. It's not, you know, he's like, and I have to say, I have really bad eyes. I can only see close up. He's like, and I wear glasses because, but even with my glasses, he goes, I was getting older and I couldn't see as clearly. He's like, and I was 47 years old. He's like, and I look and I see this thing. He goes, and it looks like how you would think of a werewolf looking but it's a complete shadow, like of the shadow of a werewolf. And it's in the middle of the hallway, and I'm looking to see if something is creating this shadow, and it's not. He's like, so I, gr- I have my phone, and I immediately go to call the police, and I look down, and my phone's making all this weird, like, it's going, beep, 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 and it's like flashing on and off, on and off. And it looks like how the screen looks when you take one of these more modern phones and break it. And the screen's all like like mashed up, you know, yeah. showing like the pixelation. <clears throat> yeah. He's like, that's what it's doing. And he goes, and I look down, it's pink, then green, then blue. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with my phone? He goes, so I turn to walk away from this creature. Um, and I call it a creature. He said, because it looked like a black seven foot tall werewolf. Very skinny, very, very skinny though. And he goes, and I walk back to my to my vehicle and I go and I get in my vehicle he goes, and it's it's late uh, fall, and it's getting cold, you know, and it's like uh, like early December. He's like, and I and then I see this thing go zipping in front of my vehicle very quickly, and then once I see it go through the fence and disappear into the road, he's like, my phone begins to work again, which is really odd. So, so that's his story. But then there was another one I got, and this is why it's confusing to me because this one also happened in Canada. But it was in Montreal, and that's why when I told that story, I thought there were two different. Uh, there were it was one and the same, but it wasn't. And this was a very s- simple, similar story, but it was very it was a very simple encounter. Uh, a guy 
uh, named Paul reached out to me. He was sitting in his in his his truck at a job site, and he was doing construction. And he was a foreman. He had a crew there, and they were supposed to lay down concrete. And they were they were working on a house. And he goes, and I was sitting out in the street. He goes, and we were working late because it was you know we were behind schedule. He goes, and there were four. There were it was a subdivision of the houses that they were doing or whatever. And he's like, and I was on the third one, and we were going to lay the the we were laying the concrete down, and I was sitting parked between the two houses. He goes, and I see this black shadow mass of something go by my truck, and for a split second, my phone begins to ring, and I look down, and it doesn't have a name or anything. And then all of a sudden, I hear like a like the radio coming through my phone. He's like, and then it starts. This is 2015, right? He said that th- it starts to talk. Like in this weird, like what sounds like robotic, almost alien-like voice. He's like, and then I get out of my truck and I look and I see this, whatever this was, r- r- running on four legs. It has no head. And it's just like a big shadowy mass on four long legs. Like, and it just turns the corner and goes between the two houses, uh, between the house that we were working on and the next door house, which hadn't, you know, was already completed. And he's like, and I'm looking and I'm going like, what the heck? What what is that? He goes, and then my phone was completely dead and I couldn't do anything with it. He's like, I had to literally go and get a new battery. The battery was fried. They said somehow the battery wasn't working anymore. And uh, so I thought that was really weird. And I, cause I looked into that after Phil had given me that story and I knew I had heard a story that was very similar, but no, there were two of them and both of them were from Canada. Um, but there's actually a third one too, and this one actually was nowhere near Canada. Uh, it happened in Florida, and so very similar thing. And it's not a real long one either. There was a lady who was walking her dog in Tallahassee, Florida. She gave me a story, uh, and she was on the phone talking to her sister, and she sees this black mass, like I'd say mass there again, just kind of floating, and it looked like it had legs, and the legs were moving back and forth like it was running, but it was in mid air going above her house, and it was black. She's like, and then what looked like the legs kind of stuck out, and it kind of turned into a triangle and began spinning. She's like, and then it just went like straight up into the sky and was gone. And she goes, and at that point, I had lost contact with my sister. She goes, and my phone was fried. So that's a very interesting thing. I took all of those together. They're not real long, but they're very interesting cases. And it all just kind of like, you know, lumped them. I kind of lumped them together because I don't know what else to do with them. They're not real long stories, but uh, what do you guys think? Maybe that's some sort of ET or something. I don't, I don't know. Like all of this stuff is connected. The fact that these entities, every time they appear in these stories or in the stories that were just told, they just completely fry a cell phone and render it inoperable. I mean, that, that's not solid. all the same way, though. The first guy's phone with the dog man looking creature or werewolf, whatever it was, it was literally like a shadowy dog man looking creature. We've heard of that. Zane yeah. saw one and then Nelly saw one. Um, different people have seen it, you know. But this creature, whatever it was, made his phone stop working, but then it began to work again as soon as it was out of the vicinity. The second guy, what happened to him, the guy from Montreal, it, it was very similar, but he saw the creature like running and moving and go around the corner. And he goes, he noticed that his crew was out there in the driveway working and none of them even looked up to notice it going around the corner between the two houses. No. And it fried his battery. The other guy or the other person, the, the, the lady who told us the story from Tallahassee, her phone was completely fried. So it was like the first phone not affected and then the other phone battery then it was fine, but the other phone was completely destroyed. Different levels of different levels of whatever, yeah, yeah, you know, whatever they're putting off that can do that. Yeah. Were they all moving at quick speeds when they? Yeah, actually, yeah. So they maybe were that has some quickly. That has something to do with it. Maybe when they reach a, maybe whatever they use to get to that speed emits some kind of something that destroys electronics. But whoa, it did did it just destroyed? Is electronic, right? Like when it went through the buildings, it didn't affect any of the other workers' mm-hmm. phones. So what is that? I think is it ran right by him because he said that when it ran by him, it looked like something that went underneath his window, and it was real close to the door. And he thought it was like a large dog, and he got out and was like, "What is that?" And then he saw it go around the corner. 
He did say, though, that as it turned the, the corner going into t- toward the, the two houses, that it got really tall. And that by the time it was, you know, around the side of the building, it looked like the buildings, it was about nine foot tall on all fours, which is weird. Uh, that's gigantic for a quadruped. For, yeah, quadruped, nine feet. Yeah, he said it was quite terrifying. But none of the people in his crew saw it. So, I mean, he thought, he goes, I thought I was losing my mind. I didn't know what I was looking at. I think that's the worst part, and that's including the story with the um, the ghost boy, demon boy, is that, you know, seeing it, everyone around you can't see it, but, like, you actively can see it and, like, even interact with it in some ways. So, like, you just, you, like, I guess just that that fear of, like, doubting yourself and your own mind, I think that, that scares me a lot, not being able to trust myself. Yeah. That's, that is the, that's pretty, yeah. and then you want to know, you want confirmation, but then you can't, you don't get it. But anyways, I thank everybody who submitted the stories to us and gave us these stories so we could tell them. Um, I didn't get to get to the, uh, the finish talking about the, the, uh, demonic vampire looking creature or the red devil in Dover. Didn't get to finish that one or the cosmic being that this woman saw. Or the gnome in Tijuana. But uh, we will definitely get to those. Folks, we're going to tell those stories for sure, either on another one of these Tuesday uh, F episodes or possibly on the live stream. Be sure and ch- tune into the live stream where we retell people's stories. Yep, if you're on the live stream on Sunday and you want to hear any of these stories, just spam the chat saying, hey, let me hear one of these stories. All right, guys. Thank you for tuning in to Paranormal Roundtable. Thank you to everybody who's been so uh, generous and helped out donating during the live chats and all the other things that, that they've y'all have done, the Patreon supporters. Uh, thank you and good night. <laughs>